I am a scientist. I love play. I love asking questions. And I'm very curious about the biology of aging. According to the World Health Organization, one in six people will be above the age of 60 by 2030. By 2050, there will be more number of people over the age of 60 than under 16. We are all aging. It's 2021. We're still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Coronavirus has only shown us how fragile our healthcare systems are. Long-term care for the aging populations is broken, underfunded, unattractive, and unequally available for all. We are not prepared as a society to age older. So what do we do? We need to boost fundamental research to understand the biology of aging. But we also need to reimagine something that we already know for a long, long time. Aging is the largest risk factor for many diseases, like cancer, glaucoma, cataracts, Parkinson, ALS, Alzheimer's disease. The incidence of these diseases just increases with age. Now, we cannot do anything about chronological aging. You know, time flies like the arrow. And fruit flies, by the way, like banana. But we can do something about biological aging. Now, I'll take you back to the year 2012. I was doing my PhD in Cambridge, across the pond in the UK, the real one. And I was in the lab doing an experiment when suddenly my vision went dark. I went to the doctor and I was told that I have glaucoma. I was just 24. It was the irony that I was working on a disease that affects the elderly, Alzheimer's disease, and there I was at the age of 24, suffering from an age-related disorder. I embarked on a year of treatment where I could not see. I was blind for many months, and I just didn't know what to do. The future was dark and uncertain, literally and figuratively. A friend of mine told me, why don't you find a distraction? Well, I love dancing. I didn't have a boyfriend back then, so uh, I didn't want to go for any partner dances. So I thought, why not choose flamenco? It's a dance that allows you to express yourself. So I went to my class, and my teacher saw my footsteps. And he said, Priyanka, have you done Kathak before? Now, Kathak is an Indian classical dance, and I had done it when I was eight years old, but just for three weeks. It was amazing how the brain, when you're young, just remembers things, and, and at a very strange moment, things can just come back. Now, Kathak and flamenco, they're very different dances in terms of their origin, geography, but they have something very similar in them, which is the power of the footwork. And probably my brain just got that back at the age of 24. So I got addicted. It was something that gave me a distraction from my vision. It allowed me to go back to the lab and do something that I love the most, which is research. I was working on Alzheimer's, trying to understand how proteins aggregate. So in Alzheimer's, there are, as we understand it, there are two proteins, A, beta, and tau, that are the hallmarks. These aggregate extracellularly and intracellularly. And with age, this aggregation just progresses, fine, affecting the entire brain, eventually leading to the loss of cognition and death as we know it. Now, what is peculiar about this is that protein aggregation begins about 20 years prior to presenting itself in the clinic in the form of these aggregates. But we don't really know how it begins. Or rather, we don't know how these proteins aggregate and co eventually come to such big, you know, these, these plugs. 
So I went back to the lab, did, started doing my experiments, and was working to design small molecule drugs that can stop these proteins from aggregating. It took me another two years to finish my studies, to finish my PhD thesis. My, my treatment, my eyes became better. I finally went to the red door, the famous red door in Cambridge where you submit your thesis and happily come out saying that I've done it. But, but, I've, but I came out feeling that now I know what I don't know, which is that I have designed these small molecules that can stop these proteins from aggregating, well, maybe, or prevent aggregation, but I don't know what causes these proteins to aggregate 20 years before. Now, I must tell you something about these diseases, Alzheimer's. About 5% of them are familial. That is, you might have a genetic predisposition to it, but about 90% is sporadic. That is, you can just get it after some age. You just don't know how. So you see why we need to understand the basic biology of aging. These drug-like molecules that were there in my, in my results just made me take a step back and wonder that if we as chemists can design small molecule drugs, then nature must have done something on its own to protect these proteins from aggregating. And there in those list of small molecules, I saw these molecules called metabolites. Now metabolites are small molecules and they are found, there are thousands of them. All of them are not found yet, but you can think of them as small molecules like glucose, cholesterol, fructose, and, and just as in a glass of water, you would be able to dissolve sugar and it would be soluble, you can imagine that these metabolites could possibly solubilize the proteins and keep them in the soluble state. But if there are too many of them, or if there is some dysregulation and it just shifts the balance, then just like sugar would crystallize out, the proteins and metabolites would crystallize out as well. Now what's fascinating about metabolites is that they sit at the juncture between genes and the environment. Now I told you that these diseases are not entirely familial. They could be sporadic as well. So there goes the clue that there could be something happening in the environment. You can think of it as lifestyle changes that could possibly interact with the genes. And these metabolites could be the messengers. And indeed, they are. They communicate signals from one cell to the other, allowing them to function properly. Like I said, they solubilize proteins. And, and they can also be biomarkers for disease. Think of the blood tests you get done when you go to the doctor, just, your, just, just like your cholesterol levels could tell you whether you would have, God forbid, a heart attack in the future, how nice it would be to have a test that could tell you if you're gonna have one of these diseases or not. Now, one thing that we know about metabolites and the environment and lifestyle is that we can do something that we already know that is, diet-based interventions to promote healthy aging. Now, science has shown us in many organisms that calorie restriction has benefits for lifespan extension. In worms, it has been seen that if you feed them with more number of calories in the form of bacteria, worms love bacteria, uh, if you feed them more number of calories, they live shorter, and if you starve them, it would just be twice the lifespan. They would live twice as longer. Now, I'm not asking you to stop eating, starve yourself to death, no. What I'm trying to tell you is that this, is ha this has been shown not only in worms, but also in mice, rodents, primates, flies, and a few studies also have, are being done in humans. This gives us some information that you can, if you control your diet, you can have benefits on your lifespan or health span. Health span is the number of healthy years you will have in your life. And that's what we want. We just don't want to live longer. We want to live healthier for whatever number of years we live. There comes the second intervention, which is exercise 
or as we call movement. It has been shown that exercise promotes biogenesis of the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, as we learned in our biology textbooks. It changes its structure, the number that can, again, provide you beneficial effects on, in health span. Now, I'd go back to, again, to 2012, to the story of my PhD thesis, when I started doing flamenco. I was looking for a place to practice, and I was taken to a care home where all the dementia patients wanted to see some cultural program. And I went there. I was a beginner, very, very nervous about my performance, not knowing if I would be able to engage them. But I was like, let's just give this, give this a try. So I went. Do you hear the pattern? There was Judy sitting right in front of me, who looked me in the eye. It almost felt as if she wanted to get up. She had lived a very, very active life, traveled the world, done amazing things. But there she was, suffering from dementia at the age of 88. And suddenly, she just went up and did this. And there I was. It was almost this moment where it occurred to me that all of this research that I'm doing might, may not be able to read Judy for the time that she would live. But there is something which was right in the moment which just reinforced the knowledge that I already had about movement, that maybe music and therapy can, can help her. Well, I was told that she lived two years longer by engaging with music, therapy, dance at the care home. So again, I would like to bring back the idea of health span to you. What can you do to increase your health span? Because that is the only thing we can do to promote, uh, to prevent diseases in the future. The UN has declared 2021 to 2030 as the decade of healthy aging. And only together, we can promote healthy aging. I encourage you to indulge in the movements that bring you joy and community, whether it's long walks, running, Zumba, yoga, or even flamenco dancing. I invite you to savor the simplicity of food choices, fresh food choices, not processed foods, to grow foods with your community in your very own gardens. You are a scientist. You can be curious. You can play. You can experiment. You can discard the misinformation that we have about foods. You can go and ask scientists, talk to them, read literature. You have the power in your own hands to promote healthy aging because we live only once. And you've got this. <laughs>